Bugs. They crawl, they dig, they hunt. And in the right environment, they can build an entire world of their own. Today, we are bringing together a group of unique creatures to create a living, breathing mini bug ecosystem. From tiny cleanup crews to energetic jumpers, every creature has a role. But in a world this small, even the smallest encounter can spark an unexpected drama, like an uninvited army that showed up before the build was even complete. This is the story of how an empty tank became a thriving and chaotic bug kingdom. To start the build, I will be turning this 20 gallon aquarium into a terrarium, so I placed it on its side. Then I will be using animal safe silicone as the first step to creating a custom background for our bugs making sure to spread it evenly across the glass. With that done, I got out the rest of the supplies. I plan on having plants a part of the background, so to make that possible, I am stuffing some of the plant holders with paper towels. This way, the expanding foam won't ruin or fill them in. Now with the plant holders in place, I got out my spray foam to start building the foundation. This will help shape the background. Once the foam starts setting in, I got out some cork bark. These pieces are going to add a ton of texture and give the background a more natural look. I pressed each piece into the foam before it dried, making sure they were going to stick to the foam. Next, I got out a bag of coconut fiber and covered the foam with it. But this was a mistake. I should have carved off the shiny bits of the foam after it cured and applied some silicone to all the foam, then poured the fiber on top. Hopefully this mistake does not derail the whole project. A couple days later, I flipped the tank back up after letting it dry, which caused the coconut fiber that did not stick properly to fall. So I made sure to shake the tank a bit to make sure I got off all the fiber that did not stick. Then I removed all the paper towels from the plant holders and the foundation of the background is done. Even though if I were to do the background again, I would do things differently. I still liked how it came out. The background is covered up nicely by the coconut fiber and the bark really enhances the natural look. Plus, the plant holders are very secure. For the foundation, I started by laying down about 2 inches of sand. This acts as a base layer to help with drainage and stability. Then got a bag of reptile soil and the remainder of the coconut fiber and threw that into a bucket to mix it together. After it was mixed, I got the substrate mix and layered it on top of the sand packing it into the tank nicely. I made sure to make a big batch so the terrarium has some depth. Now for the next step, we need to head outside to collect some natural materials to help finish off this foundation. Stuff like leaf litter, twigs, old pieces of bark that are breaking down, and I even found these giant leaves with beautiful colors that are really going to make sure our setup pops. Then I got back to our lab with all our natural materials we collected. First up was the leaf litter. Leaf litter is one of the most underrated parts of a natural setup. It might just look like dead leaves, but it actually plays a big role in creating a healthy environment. And over time, the leaves slowly break down and become a natural source of nutrients and give cover to the bugs we'll be adding soon. I buried a few of the leaves into the soil to help kickstart the decomposing process and give it a more natural layered look. Next, I added in some twigs. These help break up the layout and make the forest feel more realistic. Twigs will give the bugs something to climb over and explore. Now it's time for my favorite thing I collected. I believe these are seed grape leaves and they have some rich colors. Plus these leaves are like 50 times the size of the ones we already added. These decomposing barks are the last thing we are adding from our harvest. I think it has a bit of moss on it, which is great. It means they're already alive with micro life. I also added a small air plant to the mix. It's a great little accent that doesn't need soil. Our little forest floor is really looking like a little piece of nature. Finally, our build is ready for some plants. I got a collection of small succulents. They don't need a lot of water, which works well with the drainage layers I built, and their compact size fits nicely among the bark and leaf litter. These plants will also add life and color without overwhelming the natural look we've created on the forest floor. They fit perfectly in the plant holders I built into the background. This is the first time I've built something like this. And honestly, I don't think I did too bad. I've always been a fan of bugs, so building something like this has always been a dream. I definitely learned a lot along the way. 
and next time I'll improve and make something even better. But for now, we need to water our plants and go out and get our cleanup crew. The bugs that will help keep this ecosystem balanced and thriving. Our cleanup crew begins with the pink springtail, a tiny but essential decomposer in the ecosystem. They might be small, but their job is huge. Springtails break down decaying organic matter like leaf litter and mold. They also help prevent harmful fungus and bacteria from building up, keeping the environment healthy for both the plants and any other creatures that might move in. Once I put them into the tank, you could really see just how many there were. Next in our crew is the dwarf isopod. They will play the same role as the springtails, but due to them being a bit bigger, they'll help maintain their deeper depths in the setup. These dwarf isopods kind of look like tiny armadillos. I think they're a lot cooler than the springtails. Maybe later in this video, I will go out and purchase the bigger ones. For the last of the little guys, I bought some terrestrial ampiopods, aka scuds. These guys have a ton of energy. It was tough to catch them on camera before they dug themselves up. But when I did catch them, you could see just how cool they look. I actually have the water version of these guys in my no filter ecosystem powered by a sweet potato. These guys formed on their own. They are playing a big role in that ecosystem, making sure it stays clean and healthy. I am hoping these terrestrial ones can do the same for my terrarium. Once I dropped them in, they wasted no time burrowing into the substrate. Now for the last of our cleanup crew, I got some millipedes, also known as the scarlet millipede. I picked these guys out to help add some color. Also, all those other little guys had the same look, but these scarlet millipedes stand out with their deep red bodies and smooth segmented shells. Also, since they're much larger than the other bugs, they will help stir up the substrate a bit more as they move around the enclosure. Watching them move around was my favorite part. They are calm and relaxing to watch. If you look closely while they move, you'll see a kind of ripple effect. Dozens of legs moving in perfect rhythm almost like a wave traveling down their body. It's one of the coolest things to watch. Their head is small and rounded, with short antennas they use to feel their way through the dark substrate. Unlike centipedes, which are fast and predatory, millipedes are gentle decomposers. Their mouth parts are designed to scrape and chew soft decaying plant matter, not bite or hunt. And when they feel threatened, they have a couple defense strategies. First, they'll coil into a tight spiral to protect their softer underside. And second, they can release a mild chemical from tiny pores along their body. Thankfully, it's not dangerous to humans, but it helps discourage predators. Everything about their body is designed for life underground. Strong legs for burrowing, a low profile for squeezing through tight spaces, and a diet built entirely around decomposing. Now that the cleanup crew is in place, Let's give these tiny guys some time to multiply and stabilize the environment before we add some bigger bugs. Weeks have gone by giving the cleanup crew time to find their place in this terrarium. We can finally add our next bug. So I headed over to the pet store, but not for a traditional terrarium species. Instead, I picked up something that's almost always overlooked, crickets. I went for the full grown adults, the ones usually sold by the dozen in plastic bags. Most of the time these guys are just food for reptiles or amphibians, but we're going to find out how they do as pets. Below their section they have these containers to hold them in, but our build back at the lab makes this stuff look tiny. Once I got back to the lab, I was so excited to get these guys in the enclosure. These guys are full of energy and are pretty massive, but I had to make sure to add a secure lid. With the lid locked down, I carefully released them into the terrarium. And right away, chaos. They scattered across the surface. Things just got a whole lot livelier. I quickly learned just how skilled they are at climbing. A bunch of the crickets were walking across the top of the background. I even found them walking upside down on the lid. My lab would be full of these guys if I never added that top. I know I could have made that background better, but they look so cool climbing on it. But not all of them just chilled at the top. I found a bunch of them scurrying around the bottom and crawling on the twigs. 
Picking these guys up was definitely a good idea. They kind of remind me of grasshoppers. I did some research and found that crickets and grasshoppers are actually related. They both belong to the order of Orthopetra, which is the family of insects that are known for their jumping skills and chirping sounds. And since they are related to crickets, it got me thinking. Maybe I should try to keep a grasshopper as a pet. So if you guys want to see that, leave a comment and subscribe. After having the crickets in here for a little, I noticed one acting a bit strange. He was just slowly waving around on top of the piece of cardboard that they came on. At first, I thought maybe he was trying to climb the glass or something, but I think he may be stuck to the cardboard. I gave him a quick push and he was free. With that little guy free, let's leave the crickets to explore and introduce our last member. Dairy Cow Isopods Isopods are one of my favorite bugs, and these dwarf ones we got earlier are cool, but I wanted one that we can observe better. These guys are not as shy, and of course, they're like 10 times bigger. They're actually going to do really well in this large enclosure like this one. You can see just how active these guys are just in this tiny cup. I can't wait to see how they do in our setup. Once I got these guys in, they wasted no time, crawling all over the place. This is because isopods are foragers. Their whole lifestyle is to recycle organic matter. And in this enclosure, I've set them up for the perfect life. I built it around organic matter. Layers of leaf litter, decaying wood, and rich soil that's always breaking down. So we're going to be able to see these cute faces a lot. I was checking up on the enclosure today and it turns out the crickets have found a spot to hang out in. I think this makes them feel safe. Their natural instincts kicked in and they found a place to hide from predators. Lucky for them, I won't be adding any predators to this enclosure unless they find the dairy cow isopods scary. But as I observed the mini bug ecosystem more, I found that the isopods minded their own business. On the other hand, down at the substrate, it looks like when the isopods and crickets ran into each other, the isopods were the one that were a bit scared of the crickets, probably due to their size. But the two actually never bothered each other. The crickets continued to explore and huddle together at the top of the tank. But then I found a group eating at one of the plants. While watching them, one of the crickets actually chased off another, showing some unexpected assertiveness in this tiny world. These guys are probably underfed and maybe dehydrated. So I went out and picked up these flavored insect jellies. They are packed with sugars and moisture, which should give them a quick boost of energy while rehydrating them at the same time. On the package, it says it's ideal for crickets. So I quickly popped one in the tank. A couple minutes passed by and nothing came by to inspect the jelly. I was quite surprised because these things look kind of good. But then a cricket came jumping around the corner. The female cricket was first drawn to the juice that fell from the jelly when I popped it in. She drank some of the juice which got her appetite going, finally making her way to the piece of jelly. She started nibbling slowly at first, testing it, and then went all in. Mandibles working non-stop, little antennas twitching happily. One of our crickets was enjoying their first meal, getting some much needed nutrients and hydration. Time passed and no one else joined the feast. A lot of the crickets were still just chilling at the top of the enclosure. But I did find another cricket enjoying a meal on the substrate. It wasn't our piece of jelly though. After taking a closer look, I realized it was eating a molt from one of the isopods. This was a bit unexpected, but honestly, not that unusual. Crickets are opportunistic eaters, and a soft, protein-rich molt is basically an easy snack. In a way, it's nature's recycling system at work turning one animal's leftovers into another's nourishment. But overall, most of the crickets were not very active, probably because crickets are more active at night. So I couldn't tell if they were interested in the jelly or not. Before calling it a night, I decided to give the whole tank a light misting. Tiny droplets formed across the enclosure. That's when I spotted one of the crickets slowly making its way down towards the rim of a pot, looking to get itself a nice drink. You could see its mouth parts working as each droplet disappeared, one by one. With the crickets hydrated, I decided to leave the jelly in the enclosure overnight. And by the morning, we will know if they enjoyed it or if we need to try something else. The next day, I found their enclosure has been invaded. 
I was expecting to see our jelly had been consumed by our crickets, but instead it was crawling with ants. They weren't just wandering around aimlessly, they had completely taken over. They formed a perfect factory line, marching in and out of the enclosure in an endless stream, each one hauling its share back to the nest. These ants were on a mission, and it was crazy to see them tear into the jelly. After taking a closer look, it looks like these are black garden ants. Black garden ants are naturally attracted to sweet, sugary foods. Watching them dig, tear, and carry pieces away, it was hard not to marvel at their efficiency, but also hard to ignore the fact that our enclosure was no longer just a home for our bugs. It had become a battleground over the jelly, and the ants were winning. As I observed the ants tearing into the jelly, I noticed another area where the ants were bunched up. And that's when I saw that the ants had taken down one of my crickets. The ants were tearing into the cricket. After this discovery, I knew I had to act fast. They were not just interested in the jelly. They wanted to take over. The ants were working together to bring some of the cricket back to their nest. So I decided to remove the jelly and the fallen cricket in hopes to lure out as many ants out of the enclosure and regain control. Ants work as a team, and if most of them are out of the enclosure, we can create a chance at saving our bugs. Almost two days later, the ants have devoured the jelly and fallen cricket. After taking a look around the enclosure, most of the ants have left, probably on the search for their next meal. It looks like the crickets for the most part were able to hide from the ants at the top of the enclosure and in the plant pots. But as I searched the substrate for our isopods, I didn't see much movement. Maybe the ants took them down. But that's when I spotted something tiny. This looks to be a baby isopod. The next generation had arrived, ready to continue on. This enclosure didn't go as planned, but it just shows how wild and resilient nature really is. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe. It really helps support the channel and I'll see you in the next one.